Welcome to our channel World Inheritance. In this episode, we will talk about the second part of the Egyptian Pharaonic dynasties. In this episode, we will talk about the 19th dynasty, but before starting, we will go back a little. The decline of Pharaonic influence in Asia began in the era of the late kings of the 18th dynasty. As a direct result of the unrest caused by the civil war in Egypt during Akhenaten's religious revolution at home, which made the Hittites take advantage of these disturbances in order to lead an alliance against the pharaohs, and they succeeded in doing so. Consequently, the pharaohs lost many of their areas of influence in Western Asia, without King Akhenaten taking any action to respond to the requests for help that were sent to him by the princes of the Syrian cities loyal to the pharaohs in what was known as the Amarna Letters. The question is, who were the Hittites? They were an Anatolian people who played an important role in establishing the Empire of Khan. Its center is Hattusa in north-central Anatolia around 1600 BC. The empire reached the height of its power in the mid-14th century BC under the rule of Suppalulyama I, as it included all of Anatolia and parts of the northern Levant and Mesopotamia. Between the 15th and 13th centuries BC, a struggle broke out between the Katusha Empire, known as the Hittite Empire, the New Kingdom of Egypt, the Middle Assyrian Empire, and the Mitanni Empire, over control of the Near East. In the end, the Middle Assyrian Empire emerged and became the dominant power and annexed many parts of the territory of the Hittite Empire, while the Phrygians who had recently settled in the region were plundering what remained of it. After approximately 1180 BC, with the end of the Late Bronze Age, the Hittites split into several independent Syro-Hittite states, some of which lasted until the 8th century BC until they submitted to the Neo-Assyrian Empire. We return again to Akhenaten. After the death of King Akhenaten, the failure of his religious revolution, and the return to the worship of the traditional gods and the god Ammonius again, Pharaoh Hormheb assumed the reins of the throne of Egypt, where he was the commander of the army during the reign of Tutankhamun. Hormheb is considered the last pharaoh of the 18th dynasty who organized the internal affairs of Egypt, and who died without an heir after he succeeded in restoring security to the country. After him, one of the army commanders, Ramses I, took over, establishing the 19th dynasty. With the 19th dynasty, there was a political shift to the delta. His short reign served as a transitional period between the rule of Hormheb and the powerful kings of this dynasty. Ramesses I ascended the throne and shortly afterwards made his son Seti I his co-ruler to help him undertake some of the more stringent royal duties. While his son planned campaigns against Syria in an attempt to regain Egypt's lost possessions there, Seti I was a successful military leader who reasserted his authority over Egypt's weak empire in West Asia. The Hittites became the dominant Asian power. Before confronting them, Seti laid the foundation for military operations in Syria by fighting farther south against the Bedouins and Palestinian city-states. Then, following Tuthmosis III's strategy, he secured the coastal cities, fought at least one battle with the Hittite king Muatali, and gained Kadesh. Despite the success of his dealings with the Hittites, Egypt gained only temporary control over part of the northern Syrian plain. A peace treaty was concluded with the Hittites that established the border at Kadesh on the Orontes River between Lebanon and the mountains of eastern Lebanon. However, the Hittites attacked and reoccupied Kadesh by the time of Ramesses II. Seti I ended a new threat to Egyptian security when he defeated the Libyans who attempted to enter the delta. He also campaigned south, perhaps to the Fifth Cataract region. The reign of Seti I was a time of great prosperity. Seti I restored countless monuments that had been mutilated in the Amarna period, fortified borders, opened mines and quarries, dug wells, and rebuilt temples and shrines that had collapsed or been damaged, he continued the work that his father, Ramesses I, had begun in building the large hypostyle hall at Karnak, which is considered one of the most magnificent monuments of Egyptian architecture, and shows the fine decoration of his monuments, especially his temple in Abydos. He also commissioned innovative bas-reliefs showing the stages of his campaigns, which are remarkably preserved on the north wall of the great hypostyle hall at Karnak. Its construction had begun before that, and it was decorated during the era of Seti I with ritual scenes and pictures on the outer walls showing Seti's victories over the Bedouins, the Libyans, the Amorites in Kadesh, and the Hittites. Seti ordered the erection of an obelisk known as Flaminius, but he died before completing its inscription, which was completed by his son Ramesses II, and it is now located in People's Square in Rome. The tomb of Seti I was found in 1817 AD by Giovanni Battista Belzoni. It is tomb number 17 in the Valley of the Kings, and it is one of the most beautiful tombs in the Valley of the Kings. The depth of the tomb is about 30 meters and its length reaches 136 meters. The tomb of Seti I is carved into the rock and contains drawings of Seti worshipping the gods, and it also contains inscriptions of many books, including the two books, 
the gates and what found in the underworld. The mummy of Seti I was found in 1886 AD in a cache in Deir el-Bahari. It is believed that Seti I died before he was 40 years old, and the cause of Seti I's death is unknown, although his mummy was found beheaded, but this happened after death due to tomb thieves, and it is likely that he was suffering. Due to heart disease, the mummy was transferred to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. As for the coffin, it was carved from a single piece of alabaster and has wonderful engravings on it. It is located in a museum in London. Long before Seti I's death, he appointed his son Ramesses II, sometimes called Ramesses the Great, Crown Prince. During the long reign of Ramesses II, there was an enormous amount of building, ranging from religious shrines throughout Egypt and Nubia to the new cosmopolitan capital, Parsimses, in the eastern delta. His cartouches are carved everywhere, often on earlier monuments. Ramesses II decorated the vast walls of the temple with battle scenes giving the impression that he was a great warrior king. However, his campaigns were relatively few, and after the first decade his reign was peaceful. The most famous scenes record the Battle of Kadesh, which he fought in his fifth year of rule against the Hittites. Extensive accompanying texts present the battle as an Egyptian victory. In later years Ramesses II campaigned in Syria. After a decade of stalemate, a peace treaty was concluded in his 21st year with the Hittite king Hattaselus III. The rise of Assyria and the unrest in western Anatolia encouraged the Hittites to accept this treaty and this treaty is the first written treaty in history, while Ramesses II may have feared a new Libyan threat to the western delta. Egyptian and Hittite versions of the treaty survive. It involved the renunciation of further hostilities, a mutual alliance against external attack and internal rebellion, and the extradition of fugitives from justice. The gods of the two lands were called as witnesses. The treaty was strengthened 13 years later by the marriage of Ramesses II to a Hittite princess. For the first time in over a thousand years, princes were prominently represented on monuments. Ramesses II's son, Kemwas, was reputed to be the high priest of Ta in Memphis. He restored many monuments in the Memphis area, including the pyramids and pyramidal temples of the Old Kingdom, and constructed buildings near the Serapium at Saqqara. He was celebrated in Roman times as a sage and magician and became the hero of a series of stories. There were punitive expeditions against Edom, Moab, and the Negev and a more serious war against the Libyans who were constantly trying to invade and settle the delta. Ramesses likely played a personal role in the Libyan war but not in the minor campaigns. The last part of the reign seems to have been free of wars. On this basis, the reign of Ramesses II is the most prominent in Egyptian history, even being singled out for its great length. It was this, combined with his prowess in warfare as shown in the temples, that led 19th-century Egyptologists to call him the Great, and this, indeed, was how he was viewed by his subjects and predecessors, for them, he was the king par excellence. Nine kings of the 20th dynasty named themselves after him. Even in the period of decline that followed, his subjects called him by the affectionate acronym Sisai. In Egypt he completed the great hypostyle hall at Karnak, Thebes, and continued work on the temple built by Seti I at Abydus, both of which were left incomplete on the latter's death. Ramesses also completed his father's mortuary temple on the west bank of the Nile at Luxor, Thebes, and built one for himself, which is now known as the Ramesseum. He built his own temple in Abydus, not far from his father's temple. There were also four major temples in his city, not to mention minor shrines. In Nubia no fewer than six temples were constructed, of which the two carved from a cliff at Abu Simbel, with their four colossal statues of the king, are the finest and most famous. The larger work of the two was begun during the reign of Seti I but was completed largely by Ramesses, while the other was entirely due to Ramesses. He also founded the new capital in the delta during his reign, which was called Bar Ramesses. It previously served as a summer palace during the reign of Seti I. Ramesses II constructed several monuments, including the archaeological complex of Abu Simbel and the funerary temple known as the Ramesseum. He built on a massive scale to ensure that his legacy would withstand the ravages of time. Ramses used art as a means of propaganda for his victories over foreigners, depicted on many temple reliefs. Ramesses II erected more colossal statues of himself than of any other pharaoh, and also usurped many existing statues with cartouche inscriptions on them. Many of these building projects date from his early years and there seems to have been a major economic decline towards the end of his 66-year reign. Nothing is known about Ramesses' personal life. His first and perhaps favorite beauty queen was Nefertari. The smaller temple at Abu Simbel was dedicated to her. She appears to have died relatively early in the reign, and her beautiful tomb in the Valley of the Queens at Thebes is well known. Other queens whose names have been preserved are Setnafirat, who bore the king four sons, including Merneptah, Ramesses' successor, Murdamon. 
Neferu Are, the Hittite princess, died. In addition to the official queen or queens, the king had a large harem, as was usual, and took pride in his large family of more than 100 children. The best depiction of Ramesses II is a magnificent statue of him as a young man, now in the Egyptian Museum of Turin. His mummy preserved in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo is that of an old man with a long, narrow face, a prominent nose, and a huge jaw. The reign of Ramesses II represented the height of Egypt's imperial power. After his death, Egypt was forced to go on the defensive but was able to maintain its control over Palestine and neighboring lands until the latter part of the 20th dynasty, when the militant migration of the Sea Peoples to the Levant ended Egypt's power beyond its borders. Merneptah is the fourth king of the 19th dynasty. He is the son of King Ramesses II from his second wife, Esnefret, and he is the 13th king among Ramesses' sons, as all of his older brothers died during their father's lifetime. Merneptah's rule lasted about 10 years, from 1213 BC to 1203 BC. Merneptah carried out several military campaigns during his rule. In the fifth year of his rule, he launched a campaign against the Libyans for helping the Sea Peoples invade Egypt from the west, and he defeated them. Merneptah was old when he assumed power, as he was about 60 or 70 years old. He moved the capital from Bar Messes, the capital of Egypt during his father's reign, to Memphis, where he built a royal palace next to the Temple of Ta. This palace was discovered in 1915 AD by the American University of Pennsylvania Museum Mission. Merneptah obtained most of the stones he needed for his facilities by plundering. Stones of other buildings. The back of a stone monument erected by Amenhotep III was used to record the news of one of the major crises that occurred to him during his reign. The peoples of the islands of the eastern and northeastern Mediterranean who were expelled from their homes during the time of the Trojan War were riding the sea searching for robbery or a place to settle. In it, Merneptah repelled their attempt to invade the northeastern delta in the fifth year of his rule. Among the relics left by Merneptah are the Merneptah painting, this painting was discovered in 1896 by the English Egyptologist Flinders Petrie in the funerary temple of Merneptah and is considered the first of its kind in ancient Egyptian history. The height of the painting was 310 cm, its width was 160 cm, and its thickness was 32 cm. It was the basis of the Temple of the Dead of Amenophis III of the 18th dynasty. On its back was written a report on the constructions carried out by the king in western Thebes, in Salab, Luxor, and Karnak. Merneptah was buried in his tomb in the Valley of the Kings, which is tomb number 8 in the Valley of the Kings. Texts from the Book of Gates were engraved on the sloping corridor 80 meters inside the tomb up to the burial chamber. His mummy was discovered in a cache in the tomb of Amenhotep II, along with 18 other mummies, in 1898 AD by Victor Loret, which indicates that it was transferred to it. An examination of his mummy revealed that he was suffering from arthritis and atherosclerosis in his late days. The length of the mummy is 1.71 meters, and it is clear from his mummy that he had a bald head except for a few hairs, and his features are close to those of his father Ramesses, but the measurements of his skull are similar to the skull of his grandfather Seti I. Seti II, or Sethos II, was the fifth king of the 19th dynasty of Egypt. He was the son of both Merneptah and Setnefert II, and who ruled from 1203 BC to 1197 BC. At this time, a rival king named Amenmus, perhaps his half-brother, ascended and seized Thebes and Nubia in Upper Egypt during the years of his rule during the reign of Seti I, and ordered Amenmus to destroy the tomb of Seti II in the Valley of the Kings. Amenmus was defeated by his rival, Seti. The second, who was the legitimate heir to the throne because he was the son of Merneptah. Seti II had appointed an advisor named Pai for him, and this was a new event in the protocol of the pharaohs because Pai was of Syrian origin. Seti I married Tazard, who was his second wife, and their marriage did not produce a son, but for Seti I a son from another unknown wife. His son's name was Sipta. After the death of her husband, she became the first region of Sipta, jointly with the advisor Bey, whom some identified as Ursu, who was mentioned in the Harris Papyrus. When Sipta died, Tuzard officially took the throne for herself, assuming the role of pharaoh. Tusrit's rule ended during a civil war documented in a stela made by her heir, Setnacht, who became the founder of the 20th dynasty. It is not known whether Setnacht turned against her or whether she died peacefully during her reign. A struggle arose between the various factions in the court over the throne, in which Setnacht was victorious. The 20th dynasty in ancient Egypt, often combined with the 19th dynasty under the name of the New Kingdom. It is considered the last dynasty of the New Kingdom, followed by the Third Intermediate Period. It was founded by Setnakti, but its most important king was Ramesses III, who followed the example of Ramesses II in his rule. 
the pharaohs of the 20th dynasty ruled for about 120 years, from about 1187 until 1064 BC. The kings of this dynasty, Setnakti, the founder of this dynasty, Ramesses III to Ramses I-10, we will talk about the story of the assassination of Ramesses III. First, come with us to find out who Ramesses III is and his most important works. He is the son of King Setnakti and the husband of Queen Isis. During the thirty years of his rule, he continued what his father had begun in the years preceding his rule, with the aim of putting an end to the chaos after the death of Setnake. Nakti. Ramesses III was interested in reorganizing the administration, signing peace agreements, restoring worship to the right path, and eliminating the corruption that was disintegrating the country. This reform was achieved through the administrative division into classes, court officials, provincial officials, military personnel, and workers. The country's economy recovered quickly thanks to the huge taxes that arrived from the Nubian and Asian cities, and foreign trade entered a full vital stage, bringing elegant and expensive products to Egyptian lands, especially the country of Punt, and they were in great demand by society. This development and economic development imposed a recovery from the construction fever and the rise of new temples during the reign of Ramesses III. The Hittite Empire and other less important political entities disappeared, and the entire Near East was affected, but without the decisive intervention of Ramesses III, Egypt lost its sovereignty as during the reign of the Hyksos. Ramesses III focused on restoring Egyptian dominance in foreign policy as it was before. The complex situation that Asia was experiencing required a strong response from the Egyptian side, the Sea Peoples ended up with the Hittite Kingdom and also occupied Cyprus and the country of Nerina. The Egyptian province of Canaan received constant raids from these invaders, which could reach as far as Egypt itself. During the first years of his rule, the Battle of Duja, the Nile Delta region received an increase in the number of immigrants to a due to the search for a better life. Ramesses III was facing two groups of Indo-European peoples who headed to the Delta. In the eighth year of his reign, the sea peoples such as the Balist, Dinyan, Sheridan, and Meshwash invaded from the sea, and Tikar invaded Egypt by land and sea. Ramesses III defeated them in two major land and sea battles. Despite what the Egyptians called them poor sailors, they fought stubbornly. Ramesses lined the beaches with rows of archers who continued to throw a continuous barrage of arrows at the enemy ships when they tried to land on the banks of the Nile. The Egyptian navy then attacked, using grappling hooks to tow the enemy ships. In the brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat that followed the sea peoples were utterly defeated. Besides strengthening the Palestinian borders, it was enough to avoid invasion from the sea peoples. Egypt barely recovered and faced the same fate as the Hittite Empire. The withdrawal of the Sea Peoples encouraged Ramesses III to regain control over the Asian colonization undertaken by his predecessors. Syria was partially recovered, along with four fortified cities, including areas of the Euphrates, but the joy of victory lasted only a little, as after several years the land of Canaan was lost forever. The Libyan border was also dangerous due to the organization of the nomadic Libyan population living in that region. In the eleventh year of his rule, the Libyan army was keen to settle in the fertile Egyptian lands, so they headed to Memphis, and near the city the battle took place called the Battle of the Delta, and the pharaoh was victorious, and the numbers of prisoners were large, and they were presented as slaves to the temples. Once this eastern threat was suppressed, Ramses went towards Libya, where there was a rebellion. The Libyan forces were defeated, and the pharaoh took many prisoners. He issued orders to build important extensions to the temples in Luxor and Karnak, as well as the mortuary temple and administrative complex in Medinet Habu, which is considered among the largest and best preserved in Egypt. There were buried according to legend the members of the Cosmogony, Hermopolitana, who were worshipped until the arrival of the Roman emperors. His tomb, KV-11, is one of the largest tombs in the Valley of the Kings, Gate of the Kings, and it is very elegant and one of the most faithful scenes of traditional Egyptian art. The story of the assassination of a pharaoh, Pharaoh Ramesses III was living with members of his family and those close to his entourage in the royal palace, and the life of the palace was filled with many events due to jealousy, ambitions and conspiracies, and many conflicts resulted, the most important of which was the struggle over the throne between the wives, mothers of the legitimate crown princes, secondary wives and their children. Those who wished to rule Egypt after the departure of their father, and the conspiracy reached the life of the king himself. King Ramses III had a secondary wife named T, and she carried out a conspiracy against the life of the pharaoh, and this was one of the few times that the pharaonic texts talked about something like this, and we know about the conspiracy from the trials, which was carried out for the accused from the Turin judicial papyrus, and the conspiracy is known as the harem conspiracy. 
a number of the harem of the royal palace and some of the court's butlers, guards, and servants participated in the conspiracy. The goal of these conspirators was not known. Perhaps the main reason for the conspiracy is that this queen, T, cooperated with some women. The palace planned to assassinate the king in order to put her son, Pentor, on the throne instead of the legitimate crown prince, King Ramesses for after that. The court sentenced the defendants to sentences ranging from death penalty, suicide, flogging, imprisonment, nose cutting, ear plugs, and acquittal, each according to his role and crime in this shameful conspiracy. Ramesses IV was the third ruler of the 20th dynasty. He was the fifth and youngest son of Ramesses III. He became crown prince by the 22nd year of his father's rule. He ruled Egypt either from 1151 BC until 1145 BC or from 1155 BC until 1149 BC. M, and it is believed that he was in his 40s when he ascended the throne of Egypt. The two most important documents that we received from his reign were Papyrus Harris I, which glorifies the reign of his father, Ramesses III, by listing his achievements and gifts to the temples of Egypt. The Turin Papyrus is the oldest geological map. Six years into his reign, Ramesses IV died and was buried in tomb KV2 in the Valley of the Kings. His main wife was Deutentapet, Ramesses V, the fourth pharaoh of Egypt from the 20th dynasty and the son of King Ramesses IV and Queen Deutentapet. Ramesses V ruled Egypt between 1149 BC and 1145 BC. Two papyri of his time, the Turin Papyrus and the Wilbur Papyrus, depicted administration and corruption in the Ramesside era. She also praised the king and gave examples of legal transactions. Ramses V was buried in tomb 9 in the Valley of the Kings, which Ramesses IV had prepared and died before completing it, and which was also used by his successor, King Ramesses VI. Ramesses V also completed work on one of the enormous funerary temples that his father had begun. It is most likely that King Ramesses V died when he was young due to smallpox. Ramesses VI was the first ruler of the 20th dynasty of Egypt, who ruled from 1145 BC until 1137 BC, and the son of Ramesses III. His royal tomb, KV9, is located near Tutankhamun's tomb in the Valley of the Kings. After the death of the ruling pharaoh, Ramesses V, who was the son of Ramesses V.I.'s elder brother, Ramesses IV, Ramesses VI ascended to the throne. In the first two years after his coronation, Ramesses VI stopped intermittent raids by Libyan or Egyptian marauders into Upper Egypt and buried his predecessor in what is known today as the Unknown Tomb in the Royal Tombs of Thebes. Ramesses VI seized KV9, one of the Valley of the King's tombs planned and built for Ramesses V, and expanded and decorated it for himself. Artisans' huts near the entrance to KV9 cover the entrance to Tutankhamun's tomb, protecting it from the waves of tomb robberies that occurred within 20 years of Ramesses VI's death. Egypt lost control of its last stronghold in Canaan during the reign of Ramesses VI. Although Egyptian occupation in Nubia continued, the loss of Asian territories disrupted the weak Egyptian economy and raised prices. By establishing projects, financing became more difficult, which prompted Ramesses VI to usurp the traces of his ancestors by engraving cartouches bearing his name on them. However, he boasted, I covered the whole earth with great monuments in my name that were built in honor of the fathers of the gods. He was fond of statues that deified him, he is reputed to have been depicted more than any king in the 20th dynasty, after Ramesses III. During the reign of Ramesses VI, the pharaoh's power in Upper Egypt diminished. Although his daughter Set was named the wife of the god Ammonius, the high priestess of Ammonius, Ramsnecket, turned Thebes into Egypt's religious capital and second center of power standing on a par with Paramesses in Lower Egypt, where the pharaoh resided. Ramses VI died in his forties, in the eighth or ninth year of his reign. His mummy remained untouched in his tomb for less than twenty years before looters destroyed it. Ramesses VII Ramesses VII ruled ancient Egypt for approximately seven years and five months. Little is known about this period except that it was a period of unrest due to the high prices of grain during his reign. Ramesses VIII, also known as Ramesses Set, ascended the throne of Egypt for approximately one year in the period between 1130 BC and 1130 BC. And 1129 BC. He was the seventh pharaoh of the 20th dynasty in the era of the New Kingdom in ancient Egypt, and at that time he was the last contemporary son of Ramesses III. Ramesses VIII was one of the most mysterious pharaohs of the 20th dynasty due to the scarcity of information known about him due to his very short reign, which did not exceed one year on the throne of the country, while some believe that scholars that he remained in power for a maximum of two years, and his arrival to rule the country following the death of Ramesses VII, one of Ramesses IV's sons, indicates the continuation of the conflict surrounding the inheritance of the throne and the succession of ruling authority. 
Ramesses VIII did not leave many traces. Only an inscription of him was found on the walls of his father's funerary temple in Medinet Habu, and another inscription on one of the stele currently located in Germany, known as Berlin Steel No. 2081, which was found in Abydus, in addition to one scarab bearing his name. There is no recorded date for him except the second day of the first month of parade, for the first year of his reign, which was found inside the tomb of Kanibo in Thebes. Ramesses IX was the eighth king of the 20th Egyptian dynasty. He was the third longest reigning king of this dynasty after Ramesses III and Ramses XI. Ramesses IX ruled for 18 years and 4 months and died in the 19th year of his reign. The era of Ramesses IX was characterized by economic and political troubles in Egypt, and these problems are reflected in the way the tomb was engraved and decorated. Ramesses IX ruled for 18 years, but his workers worked on his tomb intermittently only during that time. It is assumed that this was when the court was able to bear the expenses of workers' wages. This means that even after 18 years, only half of the cemetery was completed. Ramses X, Pharaoh of Egypt between 1111 BC and 1107 BC, the ninth king of the 20th dynasty in ancient Egypt, and it is not known whether his reign extended for three or four years, while Egyptologists indicate that his reign did not extend to nine years as was previously claimed. After his coronation, he was named Keeper Mat Ra, which means the binding justice of Ra in ancient Egyptian. He is believed to be the son of Ramesses IX and the husband of Queen Teddy. Although no historical evidence has been found to prove these lineages, there is no conclusive evidence to determine the relationship between the last kings of the Ramesside era. Ramesses IX, Ramesses KV18, is an unfinished cemetery, and it is not known whether he was buried inside it or not because there are no funerary belongings belonging to the king inside the cemetery. Ramesses. During his reign, the state was characterized by insecurity and political and economic instability. There were two new powers, one eastern, namely the Persians, and another western, namely the Greeks. They appeared on the international scene as two powers warring with each other over the possession of lands, especially the Fertile Crescent. A country between Mesopotamia and the Levant, and therefore Egypt was not spared from them. The Persians wrested from Egypt some of its eastern territories in the Levant due to Egypt's collapsed internal state, the negligence of its kings in defending it and their inability to repel the Persian raids. At the end of the reign of Ramesses. King Ramesses Samandus ruled Lower Egypt and founded the 21st dynasty. He ruled from the northern capital, Tanis. Samandus was unable to control central or upper Egypt, which was ruled by the high priest of Ammonius at Thebes at that time. The 21st dynasty is the first dynasty of the Egyptian Third Intermediate Period, which lasted from 1085 BC to 950 BC. From the 21st dynasty to the 25th dynasty, they all constitute the Third Intermediate Period in ancient Egypt. The founder of the family, Samandus, only controlled Lower Egypt during his reign. Due to the weakness of central authority and the increasing influence of the priests. In the late 20th dynasty, this led to a division of government in Egypt. The influence of the central authority decreased, and the influence of the priests increased in Thebes. The kings of the 21 dynasty 1070-945 BC. By the kindness of the rulers of Upper Egypt. Herhor. High Priest Pianki. High Priest Benozem. High Priest Masaharta. The king and the high priest from the news of R.A. High Priest Penasem II. As for the kings of the family in Lower Egypt. Samandus, Hajj Kabar R.A. Stepan R.A., 1044-1070. Ammonius or Nisu, Neferker, 1044-1040. Susenzai, A.A. Kabar R.A. Stepan Ammonius, 1040-992. Ammonius Eopa, Usermat R.A. and R.A., 993-984. Osorkin the Elder, A.A. Kabar R.A. Step N.R.A., 984-978. Siamonius, Netrakebru R.A. Step in Ammonius, 978-959. Susens II, Tekkebru R.A. Sabbat in R.A., 945-959. Let us learn together about the most important works of this dynasty and its first king, Samandus, ruler of Lower Egypt and founder of the 21st dynasty. His origin is not clearly known, but it is believed that he was a minister of the north and a commander of the armies of the Delta. It is likely that he was from his country, Mendes, in Mansura Governorate. There is an opinion that says that he is connected to the ancient house, as he married the daughter of Ramses XI, who had the right to seize the throne and was called, Tanut. Samandus lived in Tanis, where he ruled Lower Egypt and traded with Asia. Then he became king after King Ramses XI and founded the 21st dynasty of Tanis, relative to Tanis. 
His reign may have lasted about a quarter of a century, but unfortunately he left very rare traces. Two of the canopic vessels that contained his entrails were stolen from the royal cemetery at Tanis, in which Simons was probably the first to be buried. The title he took was Hodge Kabar R.A., which means the deity of the sun, the maker of the white crown. One of his great interests was the restoration of the Karnak and Luxor temples. The period of Samandis' rule coincided with the period of Harihor in the south, and it seems that the two parties had reached some kind of agreement among themselves to share power and titles in a friendly manner. The content of the agreement was that the southern priests would recognize the legitimacy of the northern kings in exchange for these kings recognizing and confirming the right of the sons of Herihor and his successors to command the army and the position of high priest of Ammonius. This agreement was strengthened between the Theban and Tansi families, as, Bey Najmai, the grandson of Herihor, married the daughter of Samandus. But this situation had its negatives as well. This situation among the Egyptians was destabilized by the fact that they did not have a single king. There was no one to bear responsibility, and each of them blamed the other. This also caused the collapse of Egypt's relationship with the outside world, and it is not yet known where he was buried, but by examining canopic vessels bearing his name in Tanis, it is believed that he was buried in Tanis, Ammonius or Nisu. His existence was confirmed only in 1940, when the tomb of his predecessor, Susenzai, was discovered by Pierre Montet. Previously, his existence was in doubt as no things bearing his name were revealed. However, the memory of his short reign as the second pharaoh of the 21st dynasty is preserved in the Manetho list in the name of King Nephrixes, who ruled for a short period of four years. The name Amen or Nisu means Ammonius is the king, in hieroglyphics. A golden, curved hat inscribed with the royal name of Ammonius in Nisu, Neferker, and the royal name of his successor, Susenzai, was found in the tomb of Susenzai, Susenzai. Rule 1047-1001 BC, 21st dynasty. He was preceded by Ammonius or Nesso. He died 1001 BC. Susanzai was one of the pharaohs of the 21st dynasty in ancient Egypt. He was the son of the high priest of Thebes, called Penjum, who came to Tanis to succeed King Smendus on the throne. Susens is the Greek version of his original name, Pasebkanu, or Pasep Aka Inyan, which means the bright star on the throne. The city's period of rule was characterized by its long duration. Susens also assumed the name Ramsi Susens as an heir belonging to the 20th dynasty, but when he declared himself king and the first prophet of Ammonius at the same time, he was considered the founder of a royal family subject to Theban theology in Lower Egypt. This king moved the capital from Pirames to Tanis and moved its stones were used to build the buildings of Tanis. This king erected a temple over the sand hills of Tanis that he dedicated to the god Ammonius, with an area of four and a half hectares, 4,500 square meters, decorated with many wonderful engraved paintings, and surrounded by famous structures, they are said to be Hyksosian. By excavating his tomb along with several tombs of the kings of the 21st and 22nd dynasties, his tomb was found with all its treasures safe and not subject to looting or destruction. With this discovery, the world learned about the pharaoh Susens, and because of the size of the silver found in his tomb, he was called the Silver Pharaoh. This discovery would have constituted an important event like the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, had it not been for the timing of this discovery being on the eve of World War II, it would not have received the coverage and attention that happened when it was discovered. Tutankhamun's Tomb Ammonius I. Mopet was the son of Susens I and Queen Mutnejme. Birth name of Ammonius I. Mopet, he served as a junior co-ruler in the last years of his father's rule, according to evidence from fragments of mummy's ligaments. All surviving copies of Manetho summary say that Ammonius I. Mopet ruled for nine years. The royal tombs of Susens I and Amen I Mopet were complete when the French Egyptologist Pierre Montet discovered them in his excavations at Tanis in 1940. They were filled with huge treasures including golden funerary masks, sarcophagi and many other types of jewelry. Monet opened the tomb of Amon I Mopet in April 1940, a month before the German invasion of France and the Low Countries in World War II. Therefore, work was halted until the end of the war. Montes resumed his excavations at Tanis in 1946. He later published his discoveries in 1958. He died 992 BC. Egyptologist Kenneth Kitchen announced that there are few traces known about Ammonius Miopet. His tomb at Tanis was 20 feet long and 12 to 15 feet wide, i.e. just a room compared to the tomb of Susan's eye. Two of the high priests of Ammonius in Thebes, Simon's II, briefly, and then Ben Jim II, Simon's brother, served Ammonius Miopet. Kitchen noted that, at Thebes, his authority as king was disputed inscribed with the name of Ammonius I. Mopet as pharaoh and the name of Benjem as high priest. 
At Thebes, he was in possession of the Book of the Dead. There are four items from the royal tomb of Ammonius Imopet that preserve his illustrious name, including a necklace and several bracelets. A funerary mask currently in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, which depicts the king as a young man. Unlike Susanzai, Ammonius Imopet was buried with less lavishness as his wooden coffins were covered with gold leaf instead of solid silver, while he wore a gold-plated mask instead of gold. Sincere. Later, he was reburied in his father's tomb in Susanzai during the reign of Seman. Wasserkin was one of the pharaoh kings in ancient Egypt, around 1080 BC. One of the sons of Herihor, the founder of the religious state in Thebes, was called Osorkin, which is a name of Libyan origin. Osorkin the Elder was the son of Shashank, the chieftain of Meshweed, by his last wife, Matnusikit, who was given the prestigious title of Mother of the King in the document. Osorkin was a brother of Nimlatai, the Grand Chief of Meshush, and Matnusikit had the title of Mother of the King in a confirmed lineage document. No other king named Osorkin had a mother called Matanuskit, as it is conclusively confirmed in the Mantio list that his mother was Matanuskit. Lady Manasakt was also the mother of Nimlatai, the chief Meshwesh chief, and thus the grandmother of Shashankite Asiamonius was the sixth pharaoh of Egypt from the 21st dynasty. He was widely established in Lower Egypt as a king of the Third Intermediate Period and is considered one of the greatest rulers of this dynasty after Susen's I, his name means son of Ammonius. Susen's two foot. He is the last pharaoh of the 21st dynasty, during the second transitional period in Egypt, 967 to 943 BC. His royal name in hieroglyphics means an image of the transformations of R.A. Susans II is usually considered to be the same high priest of Ammonius known as Susans III. Egyptologist Carl Jansen Finkel noted that there is a graphite from the Temple of Abydus containing the full titles of the king who is called at the same time the high priest of Ammonius and the supreme military commander. This suggests that both the king of Tanis and the high priest of Thebes at the same time did not abandon his position as high priest during his reign. According to Manetho, the pharaohs of the 22nd dynasty were called the Bubastian kings, while Greek historians called them the Tanis pharaohs. It is difficult for a person to determine with certainty where the king's capital was in their time, and where their headquarters were most of the time, even though modern discoveries have proven that what has been uncovered of their burial so far is located in Tanis, son al -Hijer. There is no dispute that we found traces of these kings throughout the length and breadth of the country, in addition to the fact that the greatest part of them were found in Lower Egypt, which indicates that their influence was greater in the north of the country than in the south. The discoveries made by each of the archaeologists indicated, Legrand and Darcy stated that it has become possible for us to distinguish two clearly visible eras in the history of the 22nd dynasty. We find, first, from the beginning of the rule of Shashank I until the rule of Osorkin II, that the chain of pharaohs was connected, and that Egypt in this the period was a unified kingdom, and Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt were strongly unified under one scepter. Secondly, we note that since the rule of Pharaoh Osorkin II, the minor princes of the Delta began to attribute to themselves the qualities and titles of the king, and this was helped by the weakness of the central government, which ultimately led to the formation of a type of feudalism in the Delta, most of whose princes initially recognized the sovereignty of Osorkin II over them as well as his legitimate successors. It is noted that since the reign of Osorkin II, power in the country has been divided into two parts, as was the case in the era of the 21st dynasty, when the great priests were completely independent of the reins of government in Thebes from a religious and administrative standpoint, while the king of Egypt in Tanis was in control. On Lower Egypt only, although it is ostensibly considered the property of Egypt in general, north and south, and this division remained until the Ethiopian occupation. After that, a real family opposed to the ruling family arose in Thebes, and this family is what Manetho calls the 23rd dynasty, and he made its headquarters, Thebes, and then we understand that the two families, the 22nd and 23rd ruled simultaneously side by side, one ruling in the north, and the other ruling in the south. Evidence of the circumstances indicates that they were of the same lineage, and it was not long before another new family arose in Sais, present-day San, which is the 24th dynasty, according to Manetho's opinion, and its founder was the pharaoh Benaruf, whom the Greeks called the famous Bokaris. The division of the country continued from that time without interruption until it led to the rule of the country by more than twelve kings who divided the country among themselves around the year 860 BC. We know a large part of these small kingdoms, but we are still unable to date to determine all of their locations. In any case, these states did not last long, the Ethiopians, the Kushites, 
took advantage of the chaos that prevailed in the country and invaded the entire Nile Valley and took control of it by force. They restored order in the country, but for their own benefit. We do not have close sources about this era, especially the length of each king's rule, more than what Manetho mentioned, and some other new sources. However, we can judge that the period that elapsed between the accession of Pharaoh Shishenkai, the first king of the 22nd dynasty, and the accession of King Shabaka, the first king of the 25th dynasty, is approximately 225 years, according to what was agreed upon in dates between Egypt and its neighboring nations, and it is possible that the last king of the 22nd dynasty was still on the king's throne in Egypt when the Ethiopians invaded it. Kings of the 22nd dynasty, Shishenkai. Osorkan I. Teklat I. Osorkan II. Shishenk II. Teklat II. Shishenk III. Pami. Shishenk V, King Shishenkai, founder of the 22nd dynasty in Egypt, and his origins go back to the Meshwash tribe. Shishenk was the supreme commander of the Egyptian army during the reign of the last king of the 21st dynasty, Susans II, whose daughter Matkair was the wife of Shishenk's eldest son, the future King Osorkan I. The date of Shishenk's accession cannot be known with certainty, but it must have occurred after 945 BC. The plaque on which Horbason recorded the history of one of the Apis calves revealed to us the history of the Shashank family and its long-established presence in Egypt. We learned from it and from other inscriptions the influence this Lobi family had throughout the country, especially from a military and military standpoint. Religious. Evidence of the circumstances indicates that he assumed the reins of power without any resistance, and it appears that the long reign of the Nubians in Egypt taught them how they could seize the king without the Egyptian people resisting them, and that was by strongly inciting the Egyptians' political and religious traditions inherited from the oldest eras of history. It is true that even though his distant origin goes back to Libya, his family became Egyptian since they settled in Egypt several generations ago. They inhabited the city of Anasia, and became citizens, and many of them held state positions, and showed their loyalty to their homeland, Egypt. His first act was to appoint his son, Ubat, as high priest in Thebes to ensure control over this important center. After that, he began implementing a vast urban program whose immortal effects remain to this day, including a huge gate now known as the Sheshank Gate, which was called in his time the Victory Gate, which is part of from the extension of the southern wall of the famous Hypostyle Hall, on this gate was recorded, as is the custom of Egyptian kings, the news of his victories in Palestine and the history of the priests of Ammonius, members of his family. On the wall of the Karnak Temple, Shashank recorded his crushing victories over Israel in Palestine, and these drawing. King Osorkan I. Osorkan was the son of Shashank, from his last wife, Matnusakt, who was given the prestigious title of King's Mother in the document. Osorkan was a brother of Nimlad I. He was the uncle of Shoshank I, the founder of the 22nd dynasty. His existence was doubted by most researchers until Eric Young confirmed in 1963 that the extrapolation of a priest of one of the temples called the lineage of Neferhor, that a Libyan king called Osorkan was the son of Sheshank I from the Lady Madanuskit, as Madanuskit had the title Mother of the King in a confirmed lineage document. Since no other king called Osorkan had a mother called Madanuskit, it has been conclusively confirmed that he is the one mentioned in the list of Mantio, whose mother was Madanuskit. Lady Manuskit was also the mother of Nimlad I, and thus the grandmother of Shashank I. King Teklat I, born in 1000 BC, died in 873 BC. He ruled Egypt after his son. Osorkan II. Osorkan II, the son of Pharaoh Teklat I. He lived in the period between 874 to 850 BC. In Tel Basta, a huge door carved from granite was discovered commemorating the celebration of the royal jubilee of this king, and in Tanis and Tel Basta, a number of finely crafted palm tree columns were found that were uprooted from the city of Pyramuses and filled with his name, which also shows the removal of the god Set and the prohibition of worshipping him, and also the beautiful inscriptions carved on the walls of the tomb that he re-equipped for himself in Tanis, and the tomb that he built in the city of Memphis for his eldest son, who was high priest of Ta. From the memorabilia of his private secretary, Hormes, and the funerary furniture of Prince Horonket, the chief prophet of the god Ammonius, who was buried in Tanis, a selection of wonderful applied arts was formed. Osorkan II built a palace in Thebes and entrusted its management to one of his other sons, Namart, chief prophet of Ammonius. He also commissioned his grandson, the viceroy of Cush, to repair and restore the main temple in Elephantine. During his reign, the king submitted a political will to the spiritual intermediary of the god Ammonius demanding that his descendants remain within the scope of the fiefdoms that he bestowed upon them, with the aim that brother would not harbor feelings of jealousy toward his brother. 
But from the beginning of the next generation, the heirs of those feudal lords and the children of the new kings quickly clashed in conflicts and disputes. We learned of the fall of that regime through numerous texts inscribed on the walls of the Karnak temple by one of Osorkan II's grandsons. King Shashank II has a statue. This statue depicts King Shashank II standing behind the idol Ammonius R.A. He was one of the kings of the 22nd dynasty, and his tomb was found in Tanis in the delta. The king was buried inside a coffin made of silver with the head of a falcon, and his mummy was decorated with jewelry and a gold mask. Takelot II is a pharaoh from the 23rd dynasty of ancient Egypt in the East and Upper Egypt. We have previously shown that the 22nd dynasty ruled with the 23rd dynasty of ancient Egypt in the East and Upper Egypt. He was appointed as high priest of Ammonius Takelotef, the son of the high priest of Ammonius Nemletesi in Thebes. Thus, the son of Nemletesi is the grandson of King Userkun II according to the latest academic research. Based on history, this supreme Egyptian pharaoh is believed to have ascended to the throne of divided Egypt in 845 BC or 834 BC. Most Egyptologists today, including Aidan Dodson, Gerard Brockman, and others assume that Shoshonek III was Osorkan II's actual successor at Tanis rather than Takelot II. As Aidan Dodson and Diane Hilton wrote in their comprehensive book on the royal families of ancient Egypt, King Shashank III is an Egyptian pharaoh from the 22nd dynasty. He ruled during the late Third Intermediate Period, 837 to 798 BC. Shashank III, Jedba Setes, married the daughter of Takelot, the high priest of Ta in Memphis. He also married Tejas Baper, daughter of Osorkan II. He has four sons and one daughter, Inca Heisen Shashank. During the 22nd dynasty, Shashank III ruled Egypt for 39 years according to contemporary historical records. His reign was marked by political unity in Egypt, with the first pedobast appearing in Thebes. The 22nd dynasty only controls Lower Egypt. King Bami is one of the pharaohs of the 22nd dynasty of Egypt. In the late Third Intermediate Period, 798 to 785 BC, he is one of the Libyan Meshwash who were living in the country from the 20th dynasty of Egypt after they infiltrated from Libya into the Nile Delta. Bami, the third son of Shashank III from his wife, Queen Jedlahayank, held the position of great chief during his father's reign. King Pami ruled Egypt for seven years. In the period 785 to 778 BC, after he succeeded his father as king, he had a close relationship with King Shashank IV, father of Shashank V, according to the records of the Serapium painting dating back to the latter's reign. Shashank V was the last king of the Egyptian 22nd dynasty from the Mashush, Libyan Berbers, who ruled Lower Egypt. He was the son of King Bami, according to a monument in the Serapium from the year 11 of his reign. The throne name of Shoshank V is Akabar R.A., which means, Great is the Spirit of R.A. King Shoshank V is believed to have died around 740 BC, after his rule lasted 38 years. With his death, the e Kingdom of the Libyans, the 22nd Pharaonic Dynasty, disintegrated into separate states under local rulers such as Tefnacht, who ruled over Sais and Botu, Osorkan IV over Bubastis and Tanis, and Upo II in Leontopolis. The 23rd Dynasty of Egypt. The kings of this dynasty lived during the rule of the 22nd dynasty, as they were of Libyan origins, descended from the Meshwite tribes, which controlled parts of Upper Egypt. There is a lot of controversy about this dynasty, which may have been present in Heracleopolis, Magna, Ashmianine, and Thebes. It is clear from the family's ruins that it ruled Upper Egypt in parallel with the 22nd dynasty, prior to the death of Osorkan II. The 23rd dynasty ruled from 837 to 735 BC or 818 to 715 BC. Kings of the 23rd dynasty of Egypt, King Harsizi A, viewed by Egyptologist Kenneth Kitchen in his third intermediate period in Egypt, to be the high priest of Ammonius, and the son of the high priest Ammonius Shoshank C, Takelot II, is a pharaoh of the 23rd dynasty of ancient Egypt in the East and Upper Egypt. He was appointed as high priest of Ammonius, the son of the high priest of Ammonius, Nemletesi in Thebes. Thus, the son of Nemletesi is the grandson of King Osorkan II, according to the latest academic research. Previously mentioned. King Pedobastai, pharaoh of Egypt in the 8th century BC, in Upper Egypt, was one of the kings of the 23rd Egyptian dynasty. 829 to 804 BC. He is number 29 in the Abidus king list. Of Libyan origin. He was installed as king in Thebes in the 11th year of the reign of Takelot II, igniting a civil war between him and the side of King Takelot II and his son, Crown Prince Osorkan. He ruled for 25 years, according to Manitou. 
He was the first king of Thebes in the eighth year, during the reign of Sheshank III. Bejabast I was the only rival to take Lot II, and at another time Osorkan II was also a competitor. King Obadai, son of Bejabast I, who appointed him as co-regent, had already died, and apparently in the same year, 804 BC, King Sheshank VI, the direct successor to King Pedobastai of Thebes according to the writer of letters to Pharaoh Hor 9, served under Osorkan II and Pedobastai he King Take Lot III. Arth 774 to 759 BC, was the eldest son and successor of Osorkan III. Take Lot III spent the first five years of his reign with his father, according to evidence from Nile Quay. He previously served as high priest of Ammonius in Thebes. It was previously believed that he ruled Egypt for only seven years until his thirteenth year was found on a stela in the Amida area in the Dakla oasis in 2005. King Rudiman was the last pharaoh of the 23rd dynasty in ancient Egypt. The 24th dynasty was a short-lived group of pharaohs who made their capital at Sais, in the western delta. Well-known rulers in the history of Egypt. This dynasty is considered part of the Third Intermediate Period, whose most famous king, King Tefnakti I, formed an alliance of small kingdoms in the delta to subjugate Upper Egypt. This campaign attracted the attention of Pai, the king of Nubia, who recorded the details of his victory over Tefnakti. King Baconref was a king in the 24th dynasty of Egypt and was the son of Tefnakti. He ruled Lower Egypt from c. 725 to 720 BC. While Manetho considers him the only ruler in the 24th dynasty, it is said that he ruled for five full years. Despite the short period of time that this pharaoh ruled Egypt, this king was interested in the reforms that returned the country to its first history and preceded its golden age, where individual principles and social equality existed. He struck a blow. It reverted to feudalism in its civil and religious forms, fought the religious aristocracy, and eliminated the privileges of the clergy that they had acquired during the Ammonite era. In his era, individualism prevailed and replaced feudalism. He dealt a fatal blow to the clergy by abolishing their privileges as part of abolishing many of the privileges of other classes. He returned the country to the rule of individualism and turned equality into a principle applied to all legal positions, whether public or private. The Ptolemaic rulers of Egypt later called this law the Law of Contracts because it contained the rules of civil law and also the rules of personal status. The law was completely freed from the religious character of the laws that preceded it throughout the era of the god Ammonius and was devoid of any religious rule. The law was liberated from the old formalities and complex procedures and made writing the only effective means of proof. The highest law gives priority to will in legal actions, and because of that, the rule of contract, the law of the contracting parties, prevails. He was a strong opponent of the idea of debt and its bad effects on society, and in doing so he was earlier than other laws. In the past, debt was a direct cause of slavery, where the debtor's inability to pay would turn him into a slave to the creditor, which is what is called physical coercion. This is where the creditor forces the debtor to work for him until he obtains his rights from him, or the creditor was in the position of selling his debtor on the slave market. To obtain the price to pay off the debt. As for the field of personal status, the law was keen to recognize complete equality between the sexes, and women had their own money and had complete freedom to dispose of it in all kinds of ways, with or without compensation, during life or until after death, the will. She has full legal personality, which allows her to go to court as a plaintiff or defendant, and her testimony is taken into account. She also had the right to express her opinion on the matter of her marriage, whether to accept or reject it, and she had the right to keep the marriage contract in her hand, as well as to set whatever financial conditions she wanted in the marriage contract, including, for example, stipulating the right to receive a huge financial compensation from the husband in the event of marrying a woman. Other, such a condition often stood in the way of completing this second marriage, and as a result of all of this, polygamy was a rare occurrence, and the principle of individual marriage prevailed on the basis that it was the original, and polygamy became the exception and was carried out based on the consent of the first wife in cases of extreme necessity due to the illness or infertility of the first wife, for example. The aforementioned law equated the brother and sister in inheritance and did not recognize the old system that distinguished the older brother in inheritance. The aforementioned law placed the husband's debts to his wife in an excellent position and they took precedence over all other debts. All of the above are called the Laws of Bakaris, 718-712 BC. Bakaris is the name given to King Baku and Renef by the Greeks. The 25th dynasty of Egypt, also known as the Nubian dynasty or the Kushite Empire, 
was the last ruling dynasty of the Third Intermediate Egyptian period that occurred after the Nubian conquest. The kings of the 25th dynasty originated in the Kingdom of Kush, which is currently located in northern Sudan and the southernmost part of Egypt. Most of the kings of this dynasty considered Napata their spiritual home. The dynastic kings ruled Egypt sometimes partially and sometimes completely between the years 744 to 665 BC. The dynasty began with the Kashta conquest of Upper Egypt, and was followed by years of sometimes successful and sometimes unsuccessful wars with the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The 25th dynasty's reunification of Lower Egypt, Upper Egypt, and Kush created the largest Egyptian empire since the New Kingdom. They integrated into society by reaffirming ancient Egyptian religious traditions, temples, and their artistic forms, while introducing some aspects of Kushite culture. During the 25th dynasty, the Nile Valley witnessed a revival of pyramid building, many of them in what is now Sudan, and the kings of the 25th dynasty, era Nubian 680 BC, 685 BC Kashta 680 BC, 707 BC Banki C, 752 BC AD, 721 BC. Shabaka 721 BC, 707 BC. Sheku Necklace 700 BC, 690 BC. Taharka 690 to 664 BC. Tanit Amani 664 to 656 BC. He died 653 BC. M. Lara was the founder of the Kingdom of Napata and the 25th dynasty in Egypt. He was also known as the unifier of Upper Nubia. He is believed to be the founder of Napata, the religious capital of the Kushites. Kushite literature attributes a long reign to him because the kings of Kush who came after him sought a long period of rule like him. He was also the first Nubian king whose name reached scholars. The first documentation of his name in hieroglyphics was found in Egypt in an obelisk belonging to his daughter, Queen Tabari, wife of King Banki. He was buried in the royal cemetery in Al-Kuru, north of Napata, in Pyramid No. 9, to the right of Pyramid 23, in which his wife, Queen Kasaga, was buried. Scientists Timothy Kendall and Laszlo Turok agreed on this. King Anki Urpia is the first king of the Kingdom of Kush in Napata. He was placed on the throne after being elected by the priests and the Kushite people agreed to his installation. This was the case with the Kushite kings after him. Banaki ruled from 746 to 716 BC the Kingdom of Kush. During the 20th year of his reign, Anki attacked Egypt from the south until he reached the delta and founded the 25th Egyptian dynasty. The worship of Ammonius had spread in Nubia, and the kings of Kush embraced it. His father was the Nubian pharaoh Kashta, and his mother was called Babatma. He was married to Bexader and Tapiri, daughter of Alara, Abilai, Kansa, and Nvruka Kashta, and his sisters were Shabak, Amenardesai, and General Bicarder. Among his sons were those who later became pharaohs Shabataka, Taharka, Shepanupat II, and another daughter, Ardi, who is the wife of Shabataka, Napraja, Takahatamani, and Tabakan Ammonius, who is the wife of Taharka. Pia says in his coronation ceremony, the gods make the king, and the people make the king, but Ammonius has made me king. He said this after he subjugated the local leaders of Egypt and Kush. During his rule, he achieved peace for Egypt. After the peace and stability that Paya, Banki, achieved in his kingdom, he devoted himself to architectural activity and began decorating the capital, Napata. He built the wonderful temple of Ammonius, Kush, in Jebel Barkal as a replacement for the smaller, old temple. He also completed the construction of the temple that Kashta had begun to build in about 730 BC. As for his wars in Egypt. In the second half of the 8th century BC, two palaces competed over the rule of Egypt, the palace of the Libyan king located in Sais, representing the 24th dynasty of Egypt, 740-712 BC, and the Nubian king, ruler of the 25th dynasty of Egypt, 750-655 BC. King Kashta, Abu Banki, ruled from his capital, Napata, in Kush. After King Kashta was able to seize Thebes from Egypt, his rule was accepted to rule Egypt. Thus, Kushta became the founder of the 25th Egyptian dynasty. His son, Enki, ascended the throne in 745 BC in Egypt. On the plaque of his victory, which was found in 1862 in the temple of Ammonius on Jebel Barkal in Napata, at the fourth cataract of the Nile, there is a description of what happened. This painting is one of the most important monuments that describes the social and political events in Egypt in the second half of the 8th century BC. He ordered his commanders, Baroma, and Lemriskini, and the rest of his officers in Egypt, and said to them, take a position of readiness, go into battle, and surround the enemy and surround him. 
they captured his men, his livestock, and his river ships, and prevented the farmers from going to the fields, and the peasants from plowing the land. They laid siege and fought the enemy every day relentlessly. And this is what they did. He sent an army to Egypt, and strongly advised them, saying, Do not attack the enemy at night as if you are playing and having fun, and do not fight unless you are able to see, and go into battle against him without approaching him. It seems that the Kushite forces surrounded the allied Egyptian forces and forced them to go into battle, forcing them to seek refuge in the city of Hermopolis. The siege was imposed on it, and only then did Bea personally head to the theater of operations, stopping on his way to celebrate the new year in Karnak. Paya's purpose in this was twofold, on the one hand, he wanted to announce to the public Ammonius recognition of him as king, and on the other hand, he aimed to weaken the besieged Egyptian forces by prolonging the siege in order to destroy their morale. Meanwhile, his forces invaded central Egypt, and reached Hermopolis, subjugating its king, Nimrod. The city of Heracleopolis also surrendered without waiting for Pia to seize it, and its ruler acknowledged Pia's authority in a speech laden with literary expressions in which he said, Greetings to you, O Horus, O mighty king. You are the bull who fights. Bulls. Dat, i.e. the underworld, and other expressions have taken over. After those victories, Paya established the Egyptian rulers of the Delta, each in his own territory, avoiding giving much to the Libyan descendants of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs, excluding only one of them, Nimrod, as a spokesman on their behalf. The text describes the arrival of these rulers to perform the duties of obedience and loyalty. Thus, the kings and leaders of the north came to witness the splendor of his majesty, and their legs were trembling as if they were women's legs, but they did not enter the king's residence so as not to desecrate it, given that they had not been circumcised and because they ate fish. As for King Nimrod, he entered the king's residence because he was pure and did not eat fish. Then Paya decided to return to Napeta, and it was like this, the ships were loaded with silver, gold, fabrics, and all the other bounties of the north, and all precious things, and all the treasures of Syria, and the perfumes of Arabia, and the ships of the owner of the south took off, and his majesty was happy in heart, and on both sides the people on the river bank were cheering with ecstasy of joy. Whenever the news reached them, everyone, east and west, began to sing joy and jubilation when the singer of the song crossed. The Kushite king Paya preferred not to rule Egypt personally directly, so he resorted to following a policy of granting autonomy to the Egyptians, leaving administrative powers in the hands of the local rulers who had sworn obedience and loyalty to him, contenting himself with actual supervision of the Thebes region and the western roads up to the Dakla oasis. Many historians link Bia's death to the black dress worn by women in the Nubian regions located in northern Sudan and southern Egypt, where the circulating story goes that this black dress was worn when Bia died after the people were deeply saddened by that event and the women refused to change or take it off. Blackness lasted a lifetime until it became a national dress in those regions, and the matter undoubtedly has a strong indication of the greatness and power of King Paya. King Shabakana for Kaare, meaning the beautiful spirit of Are, was a Kushite pharaoh from the 25th dynasty who ruled the kingdom of Kush and Egypt in the period between 721 and 707-706 BC, according to the latest academic research on the chronology of the history of ancient Egypt, issued in 2006 AD. It is believed that King Shabaka is the son of King Kashta and Queen Babachma. Prince Harmakht, son of Shabaka, assumed the position of high priest of Ammonius. This was known from a statue of the prince found in Karnak, and from a fragment of another statue that contained part of the details of his life. After King Pia Shabaka came to the throne of the kingdom of Kush in Egypt, and he took the name Pepi II as his royal name, which is the name of one of the pharaohs of the 6th dynasty. King Shabaka lasted 15 years between 716 and 702 BC. There is important evidence that was recently revealed about the death of King Shabaka and about his foreign policy, which was characterized by preserving the independence of the Kushite Empire from the influence of foreign powers, especially the Assyrian Empire. The regime of King Shabaka is considered to be of special importance among all the Kushite regimes because the regime worked to strengthen the Nubian kingdom in general, especially in the peripheries, where his rule extended from the remotest parts of Sudan to the delta of Egypt. His regime also built many buildings, especially in Thebes, which Shabaka considered the capital of his kingdom, and in Karnak. A pink granite statue of King Shabaka wearing the double crown was erected as a symbol of the rule of Kush and Egypt. Shabaka Stone from the British Museum. It is considered a trap stone. It is an obelisk in which the names of the kingdoms that King Shabaka ordered to be protected are engraved, one of his most prominent monuments, in addition to the huge Shabaka gate that was discovered in 2011 AD and is believed to contain a secret cache of the king's treasures and possessions.
After a reign that lasted 15 years, King Shabaka died in 707 or 706 BC. According to Assyrian records, he was buried in his own pyramid in the royal cemetery in the city of Alkuru. King Shabaku or Shabaka is the third Nubian king in the order of pharaohs of the 25th dynasty. He is the son of Pharaoh Anki and the nephew of Pharaoh Shabaka and his successor. He ruled for about 17 years in the period between 706 or 707 BC until 690 BC. His royal name was Jid Ka Are, which means the patient spirit of Are, or the patient Are. In its early days, the regime of King Shabaku followed a policy of reconciliation and good faith with the Assyrian Empire. The most prominent evidence of this is the regime's handing over of King Lamni of Ashdod, who fled to Egypt after the failure of his revolution against the Assyrian king Sargon II, 750-722 BC, but only after the death of King Shabaku. King Sargon II and his son, King Sennacherib, assumed the reins of Assyrian rule. King Shabaku changed his policy towards the Assyrians to direct military objection to the Assyrian expansion in the land of Canaan. An obelisk found in the city of Alkua in Dongola, northern Sudan, shows that the Nubian king Shabetku came to the rescue of Jerusalem, and another obelisk shows that King Shabetku asked his brothers, including King Taharka, who was a military commander at the time, to come from Nubia with their forces to fight the Assyrians. The king supported the Kushite forces with Egyptian forces and sent them to Palestine under the leadership of Taharka, and the Battle of al Taq took place in 701 BC. King Taharka was a pharaoh of the 25th dynasty and king of the Kingdom of Kush, in present-day Sudan, from 690 to 664 BC. His rule lasted for nearly a century. The reign of Taharka was full of conflicts with the Assyrians, but it was also a period of prosperous renaissance in Egypt and Kush. The empire flourished under Taharka's rule, in part due to a particularly large flood of the Nile River, abundant crops, and intellectual and material resources freed by an efficient central government. Taharka's inscriptions indicate that he gave large quantities of gold to the temple of Ammonius at Kuwa. The Wadi Empire was the Nile is as large as it has been since the New Kingdom. Taharka and the 25th dynasty revived Egyptian culture. Religion, arts, and architecture were restored to their glorious ancient, medieval, and modern forms. Taharka also restored existing temples and built new ones. The additions he made to the Karnak Temple, the New Temple at Kuwa, and the temples at Jebel Barkal were impressive. Taharka continued the 25th dynasty program to develop Jebel Barkal into a massive sacred complex, centered around the temple of Ammonius the Great. The resemblance of the temple of Jebel Barkal to Karnak appears to have been a central model for the builders at Jebel Barkal. Temple cities, which were local centers of government, production, and redistribution. During the 25th dynasty, the Nile Valley saw the first large-scale construction of pyramids, several in modern Sudan, since the Middle Kingdom. Taharka built the largest pyramid, 52 square meters at the base, in the Nubian region at Nuri, near El Kuru, using a Kushite tomb the most detailed and carved into the rocks. Taharka and the Assyrian conflict Taharka began to establish alliances with elements in Phoenicia and Philistia who were willing to take a more independent position against Assyria. Turok, the Egyptologist, stated that the military success was due to Taharka's efforts to strengthen the army through daily training in long-distance running, as well as Assyria's preoccupation with Babylon and Elam. Taharka also built military settlements in the forts of Semna, Buhan, and the forts of Khazar Ibram. The ambitions of the Assyrian Empire made war with the 25th dynasty inevitable. In 679 BC, Sennacherib, the successor of King Esarhaddon, campaigned on Kor and captured a town loyal to Egypt. After destroying Sidon and forcing Tyre to pay tribute in 677 to 676 BC, Esarhaddon invaded Egypt in 674 BC. He was completely defeated by Taharka and his Assyrian army in 674 BC, according to Babylonian records. This invasion, discussed by a few Assyrian sources, ended in what some scholars posit was perhaps one of Assyria's worst defeats. In 672 BC, Taharka brought reserve forces from Kush, as mentioned in rock inscriptions. Egypt under Taharka still controlled Kor during this period, as evidenced by the annals of Esarhaddon in 671 BC, which indicate that the king of Tyre, Balu, placed his confidence in his friend Taharka. Ashkelon allied with Egypt, and Taharka was defeated in Egypt in 671 BC when Esarhaddon invaded northern Egypt and captured Memphis. He imposed a tribute, then withdrew. Although Pharaoh Taharka had fled to the south, in 669 BC, Taharka reoccupied Memphis and the Delta and resumed machinations with the king of Tyre. 
At that time Esarhaddon led his army back into Egypt and upon his death in 668 BC, command passed to Ashurbanipal. Ashurbanipal and the Assyrians defeated Taharqa again and advanced as far south as Thebes, but did not establish direct Assyrian control. The rebellion was halted and Ashurbanipal appointed his vassal ruler in Egypt, Necho I, who was king of Sais. Necho's son, Samtik I, was educated in the Assyrian capital of Nineveh in reign of Esarhaddon. As late as 665 BC, the vassal rulers of Sis, Mendes and Pelusium were still making overtures to Taharqa in Kush. Ashurbanipal exposed the plot of the vassal and all the rebels but Necho of Sais was executed. The remains of three huge statues of Taharqa were found at the entrance to the palace in Nineveh. These statues were likely brought back as war trophies by Esarhaddon, as he also brought back royal hostages and many luxury items from Egypt. Taharqa died in the city of Thebes in 664 BC. He was followed by his appointed successor Tantamani, son of Shabaka, who invaded Lower Egypt in the hope of regaining his family's control. This led to renewed conflict with Ashurbanipal and the Assyrians sacked Thebes in 663 BC. His successor was the same Atlanursa, the son of Taharqa mentioned in the Bible. Mainstream scholars agree that Taharqa is Taharqa, the biblical king of Ethiopia, Kushite, who fought Sennacherib during the reign of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 2 Kings 19 verse 9, Isaiah 37 verse 9. The events in the biblical narrative are believed to have occurred in 701 BC, while Taharqa ascended to the throne about ten years later. If the title of king in the biblical text refers to his future royal title, he may have been still too young to become a military leader. Aubin notes that the biblical narrative in Genesis 10 verses 6-7, Table of Nations, lists the ancestors of Taharqa, Shabitku, and Shabaka, An. There is no doubt that these unique achievements, both in form and content, serve to portray Taharqa as an innovator with a personality. Very special, whether in the field of official or religious literature. Tanit Amani in Assyrian, Tanit Ammonius in Egyptian, or Tementhes in Greek, are all names of the Nubian king Tanit Amani, king of Cush, pharaoh of Egypt, and the last king of the 25th dynasty. His royal name was, Baka Are, which means the glorious spirit of Are. He ruled the country between 664 and 657 BC. He is the son of King Shabaka, the nephew of King Taharqa, and his successor to the throne. While some texts mention that he was the son of King Shabaka, and some Egyptologists also interpreted the texts in this way, the Assyrians wrote his name down as the son of Pharaoh Shabaka. Queen Kalhada was the sister of Pharaoh Taharqa. In the year 664 BC, after the departure of the Assyrians from Egypt and their appointment as Pharaoh Necho I, the first king of the 26th dynasty, King Tenutimonius marched his armies, conquering all of Egypt, even Memphis, taking revenge on the Assyrians. The campaign killed Pharaoh Necho I on charges of allying with the Assyrians. In response to this, the Assyrian armies returned to Egypt again, and succeeded in pushing the Kushites south to Thebes. The Nubians' rule over Thebes continued for another eight years until the naval forces of Pharaoh Samtik I reclaimed Thebes from the Nubians, thus ending Kush's control over Egypt. From that date until his death in 653 BC, King Tanit Amani ruled the kingdom of Kush solely from Kerma. He was buried in the royal tombs in the historic city of Alkuru in Pyramid No. 16. He was succeeded on the throne of the kingdom of Kush by King Atlanursa, son of King Taharqa. The scientist Charles Bonnet discovered the statue of King Tenet Amani in Karma in Daki in 2003 AD. The 26th Dynasty, or the Sajan Dynasty, in the history of Egypt. This name they took because they were from the city of Sais. According to Manitho's version, the dynasty consisted of nine kings. The historian Africanus mentioned that Somaticus I and Necho I ruled Egypt for periods of 54 years and 8 years. The kings of this dynasty were Tefnak II from 380 to 362 BC, Necho BA 678 to 672 BC, Necho I 672 to 664 BC, Samtik I 664 to 610 BC, Necho II 610 to 595 BC, Samtik II 595 to 589 BC, Hibra 589 to 570 BC. Amos 2 570 to 526 BC. Samtic 3 526 to 525 BC. The 26th dynasties, and even the 31st dynasties are called the late era of the history of ancient Egypt. The Sajan family was the last citizen family, i.e. from the people of the country, to rule Egypt before the Persian invasion, and its seat of rule was Sais. 
Let us retrieve some information about King Tefnak II 380 to 362 BC. Tefnak II, one of the kings of ancient Egypt, was the ruler of the city of Sais in the early 7th century BC. This ruler was first called Tefnak II in order to distinguish him as the great leader of the West, who had clashed several decades earlier against the Kushite king Pia of the 5th dynasty of Egypt. 24th, he later rose to power under the name of Tefnak to establish the 24th dynasty of Egypt. It is said that he may have been killed by Shebetku and then replaced by one of the rulers. Tefnak II effectively restored the Sais dynasty and ruled from 695 to 688 BC. Then he was succeeded by Nechobie. There are several scarabs dated to this period, bearing the throne names Dnieper and Arabri, actually belonging to Tefnak II and Nechobie. Tefnak II was the father of King Necho I. The 26th dynasty descends from the 24th dynasty. Its founder, Santik I, was a descendant of Bakanref, and after the Assyrian invasions during the reign of Taharqa and Tantamani, he was recognized as the sole king over all of Egypt. When the Assyrian state was preoccupied with revolutions and civil war, and he assumed control of the throne, Santik broke off his ties with the Assyrians, made alliances with Gages, king of Libya, and recruited mercenaries from Korea and Greece to resist the Assyrian raids. With the destruction of Nineveh, currently northern Iraq, in 612 BC. With the fall of the Assyrian state, Samtik and his successors attempted to re-establish Egyptian influence in the Near East, but they were repulsed by the Babylonians led by Nebuchadnezzar II. With the help of Greek mercenaries, Wahabare was able to repel the Babylonians' attempts to invade Egypt. Samtik I unified Egypt in the eighth year of his reign when he sent a powerful fleet in March 656 BC. To Thebes, Shepanupa II, wife of Ammonius, was forced to take his daughter Natakrasai as her heir. He also recorded in the adoption steal his success in controlling Thebes, and destroyed the last manifestations of the Nubian family's control over Upper Egypt under the leadership of Tanit Amani. Natakris, daughter of Samtik I, remained in office in Thebes for 70 years from 656 BC, until her death in 585 BC. After that, Samtik I undertook many campaigns against those regional rulers who opposed his unification of Egypt. He recorded his victories over the Libyan gangs on an obelisk from the year 10 to 11 of his reign in the Dakla oasis. In addition, he liberated Egypt from the Assyrians. He established close relations with the Greeks and encouraged many of them to settle in Egypt, establishing settlements for them and encouraging them to join the Egyptian army. Trade between Egypt and Greece was also active during that era, and Sais was an important commercial center for Egypt with Greece and the countries of the Mediterranean. Samtik also succeeded in controlling Thebes, destroying the last manifestations of the Nubian family's control over Upper Egypt under the leadership of Tantamani. At that time, the state regained its military and diplomatic power, and the mobilization movement helped and some Egyptian expeditions were sent to Lower Nubia. Samtik I left a great number of installations, including painting, sculpture, and architecture, to illustrate the length of his rule. King Necho II, sometimes Necho, was the second king of the 26th dynasty, 664 to 525 BC, in Pharaonic Egypt. After the death of his father, Samtik, Necho II, 610 to 595 BC, assumed power. Egyptologist Donald Redford notes that although Necho was a man of action from the beginning of his reign, and had an imagination that perhaps exceeded those of his contemporaries, he gave the impression of being a failure. Despite this, he penetrated further into Asia than any pharaoh before or after him. Once on the throne, Necho faced the chaos created by the raids of the Sumerians and Scythians, who not only plundered Asia west of the Euphrates, but also helped the Babylonians destroy the Assyrian Empire. That empire, which was once majestic, has today become a remnant of soldiers, officials, and nobles gathered around a military leader who holed up in Haran and took the royal name Ashurubalit II. Nakao attempted to aid these remnants once he ascended the throne, but the force he sent proved too small to be needed, and the combined Egyptian-Assyrian army was forced to withdraw west across the Euphrates. Necho continued his father's foreign policy, which aimed to restore Egyptian control over Syria. He allied with the Assyrians in their wars with the Babylonians. In 609 BC, a joint Egyptian-Assyrian army crossed the Euphrates and defeated the Babylonian army but was unable to enter Haran, which led to in the following year, 608 BC, Necho was forced to personally lead the army consisting of foreign troops and Greek mercenaries. Necho too had to organize the administration of Syria, after the final extinction of Assyrian rule in the period between 608 to 605 BC. There are hieroglyphic writings from Sidon that prove that the Phoenician coast became subject to the Egyptian pharaoh. 
In 606 BC, Necho II was able to control the city of Kamuko on the Euphrates after a siege that lasted four months, but Nebuchadnezzar II, who was then crown prince in Babylon, was able, in 605 BC, to defeat him at Karchemish, present-day Tripoli, and pursued the remnants. The Egyptian army reached Hama and continued its march until the Egyptian border. After assuming the Babylonian throne, Nebuchadnezzar tried to subject all of Syria to rule. To this era, a letter from the king of Ashkelon goes back to Pharaoh Necho II asking for help against Nebuchadnezzar. The latter thought about invading Egypt, so he met in 601 BC in a major battle with the Egyptian army led by Necho at the Egyptian border, in which both sides suffered heavy losses, after which Nebuchadnezzar returned to Babylon in disappointment. Among the achievements of Necho II, one of the most important peaceful actions of Necho II was the construction of one of the largest commercial naval fleets at that time, with the help of Phoenician sailors. Part of this fleet was anchored on the Mediterranean coast and the other in the Red Sea. This fleet played a major role in strengthening Egypt's commercial position. Necho also began, according to what Herodotus mentions, building a canal linking the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Building this canal cost the lives of a large number of Egyptian workers, but he did not complete this work in implementation of a prophecy warning him that this work would benefit the enemies of Egypt. The duration of his rule did not exceed seven years. Although this king did not leave behind many traces, we know that he went to Syria, and perhaps it was only a visit and not a war campaign, and we also know that he went with his army to the south of his kingdom and reached Wadi Halfa. This army was composed of Greeks, Egyptians, Syrians, and some Jews. The Greek soldiers left an inscription mentioning their journey on the leg of one of the statues of Ramesses II in front of the temple of Abu Simbel. Necho II died in 595 BC. He left behind a son and three daughters. His son, Samtik II, succeeded him as pharaoh of Egypt. King Samtik II, or Samtikos II, was a king of Egypt from the 26th dynasty, 595 to 589 BC. Among the news of this king is that the trades of the Greeks, Samtic II, headed towards the kingdom of Judea, Philistia, and Phoenicia around the year 592 BC, in response to the movements of the Babylonians, and in an attempt to incite anti-Babylonian sentiments among their leaders. Samtic II invaded Nubia in 592 BC, and moved south to the third or even the fourth cataract. There is a famous inscription describing in Greek on the left foot of a huge statue representing Ramesses II seated, on the southern side of the entrance to the temple of Abu Simbel, also. The campaign of Samtic II was launched to suppress the rebellion of the Nubians, although it was due more to the foreign aspirations of the pharaoh than to the attempt of the Kushites to regain Egypt. The Egyptian army appears to have advanced towards Penopes, where it plundered temples and destroyed Kushite royal statues. As a result, the Kushite forces were crushed, and their kings no longer had any real ability to reclaim Egypt. In fact, this prompted them to move their capital to the south. The forces of Samtic II retreated to the first cataract, and Elephantine continued to constitute the southern border. One of the results of this campaign was the deliberate neglect of antiquities, not only those belonging to the Kushite kings of the 25th dynasty, but in an unjustified manner. Temple of Hippies, founded by Samtic II in Karga. He was succeeded in power by his son, Apris. King Apris, which means, May the heart of R.A., beloved of Neat, and the goddess Neat is an ancient Egyptian goddess who appeared early in Egyptian history. To know the ancient Egyptian gods in our channel, an episode about ancient Egyptian gods, tales from time immemorial, Neat was the goddess of war and hunting, and she had a famous temple. It existed in the city, but it was destroyed and nothing remained of it. Many antiquities were found belonging to officials from the era of King Apris, Y.I.B.R.A., who were figures who had great importance in the country and left behind several antiquities that reveal somewhat about the era of this king. These great officials played a prominent role during the reign of King Apris, such as Nazihor, Y.I.B.R.A., Ammonius Tafnacht, Pfenftenet, and others, King Y.I.B.R.A. of Apris. Y.I.B.R.A. was known to the Greeks as Apris, and to the Jews as Hafra. He was the fourth king of the 26th dynasty. King Ybra is considered one of the great kings who ruled Egypt during the 26th dynasty. He played a prominent and effective role in Egypt's political history abroad, in addition to serious internal political transformations. The first act that King Ybra did when he ascended the throne was to restore Syria and Palestine in order to fulfill his family's old hopes. There, as the title Ybra refers to the king's birth name and means, May the heart of R.A. perish, as for the title Ha-Ibra, it refers to the king's coronation name and means, May the heart of R.A. perish. 
the period of the life of King Ybra is considered one of the difficult periods historically, as there were no clear sources that show us the life of the king, nor knowledge of the date of his birth, nor the period of his rule, nor his family. All of this was considered mysterious, although there were some the opinions make this clear, as they were not complete and depended in their entirety on the writings of ancient historians such as Herodotus, Diodorus of Sicily, the historian Manetho, and others who wrote about this period. As for the story of the conflict between King Ybra, called Apris, and the commander of his army, King Amasis, due to the use of mercenary soldiers? We find that the main reason behind this conflict was the Egyptian revolutionaries siding with Amasis against their king, Apris, because Pharaoh Apris sent Egyptian forces to annex the Greek colony of Cyrene in northern Libya, but they were defeated in a disgraceful defeat, which led to the rise of a revolution in the face of the Pharaoh, because Apris did not succeed in winning the Egyptians to his side because he was biased towards the Greeks. The result of this revolution was that a battle took place between Apris and Amasis in which victory was for the Egyptians. The sources of the conflict were based on the theory Herodotus, Diodorus of Sicily, and the Elephantine tablet, the Babylonian cuneiform text. The Elephantine tablet was the only Egyptian source to correctly describe the aspects of this conflict, on the basis of which we find that Apris fought and was defeated, and then was captured in his palace. He was known as Sais for a short period, then he died and was buried in the temple of Sais, as a burial befits a king. King Ybra Apris was the first to use foreign mercenary soldiers in an exaggerated manner, including Greeks, Carians, and Jews. King Apris helped the Jews in their wars against King Nebuchadnezzar and they owed him loyalty and obedience. King Ybra loved the Greeks and followed his father's policy of granting them stability and security until the Egyptians began to accuse Apris of bias towards the Greeks. He was very close to foreigners, especially the Greeks and Carians, whom he preferred over the nationalists. Therefore, King Apris did not enjoy. He was extremely popular with the Egyptians because of his reliance on the Ionians and mercenary forces, and after the overthrow of this king by Amasis, we find that he also relied on these foreigners. The fleet of King Apris was organized by sailors from Greece, and he also relied on them. According to Herodotus, according to the battle that took place between Apris and Amasis, the Carian and Greek soldiers were the ones protecting the back of King Apris. Unfortunately, it has not yet been proven. This is because the excessive use of mercenary soldiers was the main reason for the downfall and end of King Apris. Many cemeteries belonging to senior officials and priests were found in tombs dating to the end of the 26th dynasty, especially from the era of Ybra, Apris, and Amos II, Amasis, including the tombs of the captain of the royal ships, then Bu Hakiem Saf, stable master Badinit, chief physician Samtik, chief supervisor of sealed documents Badinast, Irahor, priest Hor, Nefer Ibra Mak. There is another person called Ybra, and Ybra is considered the commander of the Egyptian military forces, and this is the largest job he held in his career, which may have continued during the rule of both Amasis and Apris, and it is possible that the period of his life occurred during the reign of the Egyptian pharaoh Apris, where his father held the position of priest of the palaces of the goddess Nit and was called Piefanit, and his mother was called Tasha Nit, the honorable priestess of the palace of Selkit. He left to us, Y B R A, a number of statues in addition to two parts of his coffin, as there are seven statues of him in the Egyptian Museum, one in the Louvre, another in the British Museum, and another statue that was pressed in his coffin. King Amasis Amos II, an Egyptian king, are 570-526 BC, of the 26th dynasty of Egypt, succeeded Apris in Sais. He was the last ruler of Egypt before the Achaemenid Persian invasion led by Cambyses II. Most of our information about him is derived from Herodotus and can only be imperfectly verified by voluminous evidence. Amasis was originally an officer in the Egyptian army. His birthplace was in Sais. He participated in a general campaign of the Egyptian king Samtik II in 592 BC in Nubia. A revolt broke out among the native Egyptian soldiers and gave him a chance to seize the throne. These troops, returning home from a disastrous military campaign from Cyrene in Libya, suspected that they had been betrayed so that the reigning king Apris could rule with certainty through his Greek mercenaries, many Egyptians completely sympathized with them. The general Amos II or Amasis, who had been sent to meet them and suppress the rebellion, was declared king by the rebels instead, and Apris was defeated, who then had to rely entirely on his mercenaries as previously mentioned. Apris fled to the Babylonians and was captured and killed in 567 BC with the help of the Babylonian army. 
An inscription confirms the conflict between native Egyptian soldiers and foreign military personnel, and proves that Apris was killed and buried in the third year of the reign of Amos II, ca. 567 BC. Then Amos II married Shide ben Jerban II, one of the daughters of Apris, in order to legitimize his kingship. During the Persian rule, he was Cyrus the Great, as almost the greatest Persian emperor in history, was the emperor who eliminated the Babylonian Empire and the Lydian Empire, and also annexed the Phoenicians' possessions to his empire, so Persia, the Achaemenid Empire at that time, became the largest pole of the world at that time, but his dream was not completed in his life to annex the Egyptian state to his rule. But his son Cambyses II, who ruled for much fewer years than his father, was able to conquer Egypt and subject it to wisdom and power. When Cyrus died in December 530 BC, his son and heir Cambyses II succeeded him, and the first years of Cambyses' rule were relatively calm. In the year 525 BC, Cambyses II sent to Amos II, pharaoh of Egypt, asking him to marry his daughter to him, but Amos hated marrying his daughter to Cambyses, so he created a trick that was revealed later, which was that Amos sent to Cambyses his son, the former pharaoh, Apris. When Cambyses discovered the trick, he decided to invade Egypt, and when Cambyses wanted to annex Egypt came to him, and on the way he heard of the death of Amasis. His son, Santic III, took his place. Cambyses, on the other hand, had concluded an agreement with the king of the island of Samos to provide him with a huge naval fleet. The continuation of the story will be discussed later with King Santic III, son of Amos II, Santic III, or Ankh-Enare, the last of the Egyptian pharaohs and the last of the 26th dynasty. He ruled Egypt for the period 526 BC, 525 BC. He assumed power, and after six months of his rule, he was facing the Persians. We return to continue the story. During the reign of Amos II, Egypt was known for its great progress and stability throughout his reign. However, there were some weaknesses that seemed to pose a clear danger in the structure of the state, namely that the Egyptian army was mainly composed at that time of many foreign mercenaries, which made them suspect. The result of this was that one of the army commanders joined the ranks of Cambyses' army and informed him of the plans and locations of the Egyptian army on the desert roads. Cambyses marched with his army along the Mediterranean coast, supported by a powerful Phoenician fleet. Samite III tried to stop the Phoenician fleet, as he had the hope that Egypt would be able to withstand the threat of a Persian attack through an alliance with Greece, but they preferred to join the Persians, and Santic III remained alone without allies. Cambyses' forces reached the city of Pelusium, and the Persian forces defeated the Egyptian forces in the battle and continued the siege of Memphis. After the fall of Memphis, Cambyses continued his march along the Nile River until Egypt was completely controlled by Cambyses II. He then went to the Egyptian capital, Sa'i al-Hijar, to crown himself pharaoh. Then he assumed the Egyptian throne and participated in the Egyptian celebrations, as his father did when he conquered Babylon and treated Cambyses. Amos II treated Amos II with humiliation and treated his sons in the same way. Herodotus also narrated that Cambyses ordered Amos to drink the blood of a bull and he died instantly.